The computers are truly our keys to the future. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Decrypting Crypto podcast, a CastBox original show. I'm Austin Knight, and as always, I'm joined today by my co-host, Matthew Howells Barbie. Good to be not sitting alongside you, but virtually sitting alongside you, Austin. <laughs> Across the time zones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so today's episode is going to be pretty cool. We're taking a deep dive into the world of crypto mining. And the reason for that is there's actually been a lot of news recently around ASIC miners, and we'll explain exactly what those are later if you don't already know. So we're going to be dedicating our main feature to looking at these very things, taking a look at the current state of the mining industry. That's right. And we it's worth reminding our listeners, like we did an episode back in the first series that gave more of an introduction to crypto mining. So if this is of interest to you and you enjoyed this episode, or if some of it kind of goes over your head, I'm sure you'll enjoy that episode. But before we get into our main feature, we're going to just run through some recent news. Yeah. And one of the big developments over the past couple of weeks involves Coinbase. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so Coinbase has started to begin the process of opening the floodgates and inviting other cryptocurrencies to be listed within their exchange. Yeah, this is a pretty big step because up until this year, 2018, Coinbase really had locked down their platform. And this was to a small number of cryptocurrencies. I mean, I remember in for pretty much the, the entire of Coinbase's time, it was like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. And then when yeah. Bitcoin Cash was added, then we had in early 2018, Ethereum Classic. And now it looks like they're actually going to invite a whole host of other tokens, currencies, uh, coins into the platform yeah. at some point, right? Yeah, this is a huge move from my perspective because we've talked so much on the show about how usability and ease of use is the greatest barrier to adoption of blockchain and mm. crypto right now. And Inevitably, that problem is going to be solved, of course, but Coinbase has been at the forefront of, of solving that. I think that they, you could argue that they started to solve that problem before it was even really recognized amongst yeah. the community as a real problem. And I think that that drove a lot of the adoption that we saw in late 2017 when all of the values were going up. There was all of this mainstream press around cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandpa was investing in crypto via Coinbase. <laughs> Base. So every time that Coinbase announces that they're adopting a a new cryptocurrency, it's a pretty big deal because essentially that that becomes like the de facto introduction of that cryptocurrency to the mainstream market. At least that's typically how things have gone. Yeah. But this is this is a, a little bit different because in the past they would only they would very rarely introduce a new cryptocurrency and it was one cryptocurrency. It was a big announcement, a big deal. Now this seems like they're opening it up to anybody that, that would want to potentially list on the exchange, which I think that comes with a lot of major implications around the future of crypto, but also the future of Coinbase and perhaps how their brand could be perceived going forward should this backfire on them. Just really quickly, to give their perspective on this, Coinbase quoted on their site, our goal is to rapidly list all assets that meet our standards and are compliant with local law while providing our customers with the tools to discover, evaluate, trade, and use digital assets. So you can kind mm -hmm. of see like, how aggressive of an approach they're taking here. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's that's a, a good point that you made previously, right, is that when you think about 2017, I remember there being a lot of like rumors that, well, the, the, the consistent rumor was always XRP is going to be listed on Coinbase. You'll be able to buy Ripple there, right? And whenever those rumors came out, it would have huge price spikes. And now it seems that actually they're just going for 
a real wide net that they're going to cast. I have no idea what that user experience is going to be like, because like you said, when you go into all of the other exchanges out there that are less kind of your grandpa friendly, let's say, and uh, you've got the likes of Binance, Bitfinex, et cetera, they, they look like something out of a wall street movie when you're, when you're new to them. Right. And yeah. it's, it's not that user friendly Coinbase was super simple come in here and buy like one of three things buy this interface that kind of looks a bit facebooky and is simple to use right mm-hmm. i i don't know how they're gonna manage that and yeah there's also the element of like reputability right like they really locked this down not primarily for usability but primarily so that their risk of any of these projects kind of going south wouldn't reflect badly on them. Yeah, yeah. I think that we can certainly speculate around why they might be doing this, possibly because the majority of the crypto market is in a free fall right now. <laughs> and yeah. so they may be looking to to drum up a diverse set of, of business beyond just these core coins, right? Which that would make sense to me. With that said, I'm almost led to believe that that's not the case because I remember several months ago when I was speaking to some of the designers there uh, and they were you know very aggressively scaling the platform they were looking for input around how they could scale to more than five currencies and and this was back in I want to say like November maybe even October of 2017 yeah. so they were thinking about scaling to this level well before the cryptocurrencies for the most part you know ran up against major drop offs in value but I still think that it's it's especially an interesting move now given the current context of the crypto economy Yeah, I agree. And I think it's interesting you talk about diversification there, because I think it does start to, from a a crypto investor's point of view, right? First of all, it makes sense to diversify a portfolio, but also I think for relatively new investors, they're almost spoiled for, for choice on a lot of other platforms. Coinbase solved that problem to an extent, but yeah. with them introducing a lot more different choice on the site, Uh, one feature that they've also just announced is their bundles feature. And this pretty much came out around the same time that they announced they'll be accepting applications from other crypto projects to be listed. But what their bundles feature is, is basically you can go in, select how much you want to spend on your crypto in like USD, Euro, GBP, whatever, right? And it will then just purchase a selection of different cryptocurrencies from their site in a bundle for your set amount. I, I get a feeling, I, I can't imagine why you would want to use that feature. I mean, it's, I know yeah. it's just, I think it's going to be aimed at people that are just getting involved for the first or second time, which is what Coinbase is all about. But with a lot more tokens being listed, it, it probably will be a lot easier for them to do that and almost maybe create some kind of like basic index that you can follow as well. Yeah, I get that. This this sounds to me like a a very poorly constructed penny stock mutual fund (laughs) (laughs) at first. It it, it feels like, you know, I, I get what they're getting at, which is this is your opportunity to invest at a very broad and and diverse range uh, without putting too much thought or effort into it. But I don't think that typically, at least in the past, putting zero effort into an investment, unless you're using like a very well proven, like a Vanguard index fund, that I don't think that that generally works. So uh, especially with something as volatile as a cryptocurrency. Yeah. But it's 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 interesting and I think that this brings me back to this worry that I generally have about this move from Coinbase and the feeling that perhaps this could be, you know, an attempt to scale their business as cryptocurrency values are falling. I'm worried that as they bring on a bunch of additional cryptocurrencies, that their brand perception could be hurt if they end up getting involved in some type of a a falling out with a cryptocurrency or, or a scam. Mm-hmm. The platform could feel less safe. I think there's also the usability issues that we sort of 
hinted at earlier where like it was very nice to log into Coinbase and it felt very reassuring when you only saw three cryptocurrencies, three beautiful graphs. And it was it was like the Apple of crypto. It was yeah. like these are these are your three iPhone choices. They're the best phones. They're the best cryptocurrencies. Pick one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I can um, And I think it's going to feel, it'll feel a little bit less like that now, uh, which sort of coincides with like these weird things that are happening with, with this general move that they're making. Like, for example, the way that you apply to be listed on Coinbase now is via a Google form. Yeah. It's, um, it's like the shadiest, weird thing. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. like the, you're just submitting that by a Google form, like surely there should be something a bit more built out for this. Yeah. I do think on that note though, and this is important to, to call out, right, is that they did announce back in March that they'd be supporting ERC-20 tokens in the near future. They haven't necessarily done all of that yet. We, we have got an application process where they're inviting people to apply. They haven't made any firm commitments yet to doing this. What we could find out is that, hey, you know, none of this actually ends up happening in the, the yeah. near future. Completely possible. Yeah, I think they're probably testing out demand initially, hence why just a simple Google form right now and nothing too formal. But we'll have to see how that pans out. I think the one thing that I would say to round this off, though, is like, I think Coinbase, we would both agree they've been a pioneer in this industry so far at making things simple and approachable. But they're probably also seeing the likes of Binance making huge amounts of cash right now, the, the world's largest exchange, I believe. And they've probably got their eyes on that prize as well. Yeah, I'm sure. And speaking of pioneers, this smooth transition there. I hope you like that, Austin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tim Berners-Lee has been in the news surrounding his new project, right? And He's been working on this, I believe, the past nine months, but part of a bigger project that's been happening over the past few years to create a decentralized version of the World Wide Web. Yeah. So this is super interesting. Tim Berners-Lee, he's the inventor of the original World Wide Web, and he's launched this new project, which he's called Inrupt, and it's excited a, a lot of people. It's very interesting. A quote on the homepage of the website says, it's time to reset the balance of power on the web and reignite its true potential. And I think that for both Matt and I, as people that grew up on the web and built our careers, and for that matter, our lives on the open web and view Tim Berners-Lee as like a true hero. He, um, is, he is an OG hero, right? Yes, like, uh, <laughs> extremely influential and intelligent, forward-thinking person. This is a big deal yeah. to to hear him making these large statements about a, a project to create a next, if you will, iteration of the web. Yeah, it's fighting talk. It's fighting talk from, uh, it's, from Big it Tim. It really is. It's, it's amazing. It's <laughs> almost like he's he's not just saying, like, this is the next iteration as much as it's like, you know, that original web that we created, it didn't do, it's not living up to what we wanted it to be. Yeah. That is, like, the general tone of this. So it's intense. Yeah. It certainly is. And I think there's been actually a, a number of great like articles that have been coming out or interviews with Tim Berners-Lee that's been talking about some of this. And like you said, it seems like his opinion really here is like he feels let down with what has kind of transpired with the baby he created, right, in the World Wide Web. Yeah. So break down, you know, a little bit more about this this project than me, Austin, so far. So why don't you give, give me a bit of a lowdown on what, what Tim's up to? Yeah. So there's still, I would say, fairly limited concrete information on Inrupt right. on their website right now. So it's not completely clear exactly what this is going to be. But there are some key themes that we can pull out of it. The first is a theme around decentralization and data ownership. So the idea of the web being fully decentralized, that's our king buzzword now. <laughs> and then our second 
amazing buzzword, buzz phrase, I guess you could say, data ownership, which yeah. both of these are very uh, important. They're, they're critical to this technology and its value proposition. But Tim is really doubling down on this with the idea of this next iteration of the web. So the user would actually own their own data. And I'll go into some detail about how that would actually work. But then there's sort of this like underlying theme to that, which is killing the profits of a few and sort of dispersing that out to many, uh, which I think that makes sense given the the roots that Tim has, you know, with yeah. the web, the this sort of dream for the open web and, and then this world that we live in now uh, where the web is dominated in large part by highly profitable walled gardens like yeah. Facebook. That is the antithesis of what Tim had, uh, and and for that matter, many of the pioneers, if not all of them, had imagined for the web. Uh, so it makes sense that decentralization, data ownership, and sort of a little bit of bucking of this idea of like closed community profit would be a key theme of this project. They also talk a lot about cross compatibility and universal data. So this idea of all apps sharing data and being able to communicate with each other. I'll discuss more around how that could actually work as well. But then there's this sort of like, I, I felt like this was a little bit out of left field, maybe like a, a long shot attempt to say, oh wait, you can still make money at this. Like we're not gonna burn down the whole web. <laughs> they talk about creating a new ecosystem for commerce. And this is the one that it's least clear to me how this would actually work. And there's very little detail on that, but it, at least it's an indication that they are still thinking about monetization. So this, this actually brings me back to that first key theme, decentralization and data ownership, and this underlying theme of killing profit. I'm totally bought in on the idea of decentralization and data ownership. Frankly, I am much more skittish about the idea of really having a, a, a fighting call to kill profit on the web. I think that's dangerous because as much as we are romanticized, we've romanticized this idea that, you know, the open web was created for everyone, by everyone, and we want to keep that as healthy as possible. The reality is that underlying that open web, the very fabric of that open web, that the, the thing that supports it is revenue primarily yeah, from, from yeah. ads. And many of the great products and inventions that we benefit from every single day that we use the web, they were created expressly with profit motivation. And so there is this, this sort of positive reinforcing relationship that the open web has had with profit motivated projects. It's just that as of late, some of them have gone a little bit too far into <laughs> yeah. closed profit profit motivation. Yeah, and I think that like on that note, right, like it seems that a lot of the arguments around here stem from large centralization of profits as well. And yes, that, it is going to be very difficult to tackle. I think that alongside the web, I, I, I think that we may end up to, to be fair, you can make an argument even now, but in the next five or six, seven years, we'll look back at the rise of blockchain in the same way. Uh, you're already looking at like a number of big key players. We've talked about a few of them already on the show, and we're going to continue to talk about a few of them later on that are ultimately making the lion's share of all of the profits from yeah. broader blockchain technology now. Hopefully it doesn't go that way, but I, I would say I, de I definitely agree with you around the, the piece around the A, underlying anti-profit arguments that, that are being made for, for this, where ultimately I don't think that decentralization and the reduction or the incentive of like profit generation necessary or against profit generation actually do go hand in hand in this sense. Yeah, yeah. With that said, there's some really cool technology that they're pushing. So Interrupt is powered by something called Solid, which is the project that Tim Berners-Lee has been working on for a little bit longer than Interrupt itself. And a quote from the Solid site says, Solid empowers users and organizations to separate their data from the applications that use it. It allows people to look at the same data with different apps at the same time, and it opens brand new avenues for creativity, problem solving, and there you have it, commerce. <laughs> um, so 
really what what this does is at the core of solid, as far as I can understand, is this concept of something called a solid pod where you physically own and store your data and then you give apps read write access to your data your photos your comments your contacts your calendar events i think that that's the core invention yeah. that that they're coming up with here is that you would have total possession over all of your data so like all all of the stuff that facebook has about me right now i would have possession of that everything that apple has about me i would have possession of everything that google has on me i would have possession of and then i I would choose to give them read write access to that data but i actually physically own a device that that data is kept on uh, yeah. so it's a very very interesting idea it is and uh, that actually ties in nicely to next week's podcast episode where we're speaking to edmund from selfkey that's all focused around digital identities and ownership as well where we dig into this in a lot more detail so i think this sets us up nicely to, to talk about that. And I'm sure, Tim, I'm sure you're listening, Mr. Berners-Lee, Sir <laughs> Berners-Lee, um, you, you want to comment on anything that we're saying? I'm sure you're an avid subscriber. You know where to find us. We don't even need to tell you our email. Like we're, we're, we're close <laughs> enough, right? Uh, <laughs> He's in my living room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Cursing you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our main feature before we get ourselves into a lawsuit with Tim Berners-Lee. Um, <laughs> um, today, we're going to be exploring the confusing and highly profitable world of ASIC mining. Okay, so for some of you, you may be wondering what the hell ASIC mining means and what the hell an ASIC is. So let's just start with a few quick run-throughs of the basics. So when we're talking about an ASIC, this is an acronym, stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. It's a type of processing chip, and it's designed for one specific task. And this is unlike a regular GPU or graphics processing unit, which is made for a whole host of different tasks, which for the ASIC means it's so, so efficient at doing this one thing, whereas with a GPU or a CPU, it's pretty efficient, but it's more flexible at being able to do a whole host of stuff like playing video games, uh, rendering like ultra high definition movies, processing VR applications, et cetera, et cetera. It has a lot more flex in its design, it's good at doing lots of things versus with an ASIC being like truly superb at one single thing. And crypto mining to one side, because we can, we can chat about that in specific to crypto mining, but ASIC chips are not just used in, in mining. They're, they're actually used in all kinds of hardware that exist out there. A couple of examples uh, where ASIC chips are used is a cell phone. So in an Apple iPhone, it uses an ASIC chip that's designed specifically to power an iPhone because it doesn't need to do other tasks that an iPhone doesn't do because it lives inside an iPhone. And <laughs> similarly with things like satellites where it has very specific tasks, it doesn't need to project a high definition movie into space. It has a set Set list of tasks, and that's what the chipset is designed specifically for. Yeah, this highlights a really cool pattern as a side note with crypto and blockchain, where crypto requires such heavy processing power in some respects to the point where it's actually pushing the chip industry forward. NVIDIA yeah. on the GPU side is just down the street from me here. They've got this beautiful new building, they're trying to recruit new people. They are <laughs> pushing the technology so far forward because they are motivated by uh, the unique needs of crypto and the amount of effect that this is having on other related technology is, is really cool. So you can start to see things being used in cell phones, satellites, etc. as you mentioned, Matt. But back to ASIC specifically, their relevance to cryptocurrency mining is actually pretty high. So the first ever ASIC mining rig came from the Avalon project back in January of 2013, and that was focused on mining Bitcoin. Since then, and in particular over the past two years, ASICs have become a huge part of crypto mining with nearly yeah. all major projects supporting ASIC miners and also having a few different options to choose from in the market. So you're seeing more pop up. Yeah. ASIC miners are also very expensive to develop, though. David 
Vorik of Saya wrote an article a couple months back that suggested that the development of a new ASIC miner costs in the range of six to ten million dollars. Dollars. Wow. So, yeah, <laughs> what this means is that most ASIC mining rigs cost around a thousand dollars at the minute. But during the peak of 2017's ICO boom, they were being sold for as much as four thousand dollars. Yeah, I saw actually some of the the Bitmain ASIC miners. And when we're talking about, they cost a thousand dollars right now, like for the consumer, for me and you wanting to buy them, right? And I remember seeing on like eBay when. All of Bitmain's new, I think it was like their Ant Miner product, it sold out in like a few seconds. And they were going for crazy prices on eBay. And it's just, I think now that we're seeing a bit of a dip in the market, they're coming down in price, but they they cost significantly more in general than something like a GPU that you would you would purchase. But to talk a little bit there about like, okay, we've talked about what it is, but the big advantage here from a mining perspective, right? You, you've got an ASIC miner, the like a, a mining rig with an ASIC chip in it. They're designed specifically for mining. And in particular, a lot of these ASIC miners are designed specifically for mining one cryptocurrency. Some do multiple, but we're going to focus a bit more on the ones that are just for one. And when you compare that to like a GPU or a CPU, they're just absolutely way and beyond superior in terms of their performance. So like generally speaking, the way that you determine the processing power or how powerful an ASIC chip is when it comes to crypto mining, this is a slight oversimplification, but it generally holds true, is by how many nanometers the processor is. So the lower, the better here. So for example, a 28 nanometer chip would not be able to compete with a 16 nanometer chip. And once, and this is a key piece here, once a significant portion of miners on a network start using ASICs, they're just, they're able to achieve enormous hash rates. That's processing power, which basically means anyone that's now using a GPU or a CPU miner basically renders them redundant because at the end of the day, all miners are competing to solve a block on the blockchain. If one miner has a a far superior hash rate to another, it's highly likely that they're going to get the reward over the GPU miner. This means the GPU miners can't make a profit, end up having to shift over to the ASIC mining hardware and investing more and more into this process. And that is how Bitmain and Co get incredibly (laughs) rich, right? Which is just is is becoming a probably the, the the most profitable aspect of cryptocurrency and blockchain right now. Yeah, what we've seen as a result though is that major GPU manufacturers like Nvidia and AMD, which I mentioned earlier, have started to pull out of the crypto mining yeah. hardware space now because they just can't compete with ASIC giants like Bitmain. It's interesting because the gaming industry and the VR industry were going crazy. I mean, being involved in VR in particular, Austin, you'll have probably heard rumblings of this, but in like 2017, the the same GPUs are being used for gaming and VR as they are for crypto mining. And back in 2017, during the boom, and just check out NVIDIA's stock price, by the way, uh, during 2017, which was also a boom, they were producing the same chips that would be, let's say, 600 bucks were going for as much as like 2000 bucks just because of pure demand. Um, so I think a lot of people that are in the gaming and the VR and uh, high end like video editing and processing, they're probably a bit happy now that some of yeah. these like statements from NVIDIA in particular, but also AMD, that they're pulling back on some of this is happening. Yeah. With that said, ASICs specifically are generally good for cryptocurrency because they dramatically increase the overall hash rate on the network, making it secure and tougher to attack. So this is a controversial topic because there are arguments that it can give more power to individuals and actually contribute to centralization, which we'll discuss. So that is a problem. 
Nearly all 51% attacks that have happened on blockchains to date have actually been from primarily GPU-mined cryptocurrencies. Yeah, that's a, that is an interesting stat. I, I, I think to touch on what you were talking about there, right, is that the reason why blockchains that are primarily using ASIC mining, it, they're just able to add so much more processing power to the network, which means that it becomes much more difficult to poison attack on the network. But similarly, when you just when you don't have ASICs running the mining on a proof of work blockchain, it means that if you're using GPUs, the hash rate's generally lower, or you're going to need a huge amount more miners to make up that hash rate. And it means it's a lot easier to attack. But, and this is where we were going to discuss, right, it can be used to assert power and control. What and, th and I think this is a big piece that we, we should touch in because it's primarily around the hardware manufacturers. So this is something that is something I find kind of crazy and uh, quite frustrating about this whole industry. And what a lot of major ASIC manufacturers have done is they've built superior technology, like really low nanometer chips, delayed its release to the general public. Bitmain has been consistently criticized for this. And then they will use that tech to mine the cryptocurrency themselves before anyone can compete with their processing power. Then they will release to the general public at an incredibly high margin, sometimes as much as 50 to 100%, to then further their profits on top of this. And we talked about the centralization of mining in Bitcoin in series one, and primarily that came from Bitmain, right? And, and this was all due to the rise of ASICs. Yeah. Related to this, recent news that has just happened with Saya, who we talked about recently on the podcast as well, has shown that some projects are fighting back. So... Saya have just forked their blockchain to make Bitmain and InnoSilicon ASICs that are built for a single purpose obsolete. This now means that their own ASIC miner, funded by the community through the company Obelisk, can now be used effectively. Something to note on here is that their community voted against this and they decided not to fork. But then a couple weeks later, the core Saya team went against this and did it Anyway, uh, there's some really good reading on this that mm. we'll link to in the description. Yeah, there was a really good article that David Vorick, the CEO of, I forget that parent company, I think it's Nebulous the, the, that uh, runs through Sire. Uh, he did a full write-up on why this has happened. And if you listen to our episode on Sire recently, I think it was a couple of weeks back, you'll know that we talked a bit about how their community funded their own ASIC miner, Bitmain caught wind of this, released a superior product a few weeks before, rendered their whole project null and void, basically. And they have now took pretty huge action to basically fork the whole blockchain. And what this means, right, is you've got Bitmain and also this, this company, Inner Silicon, that developed ASICs on the SIA blockchain. They're developed and designed to do one specific thing, and that's mine in the current way that the, the proof of work algorithm works. Now that they've reset this, changed it, it renders their ASIC miner useless. And they would have to redevelop something, which I'm sure they probably still will do this, which begs the question, do they just keep forking the blockchain continuously, <laughs> which is, an, it, it is a real challenge, which I, I don't know how you could con continue to do that. But also, I don't know. I love the SIA team. I love the project. Should they have the right to do this? Is this kind of up to them to say who can build mining hardware that powers the blockchain? And are they actually doing the very thing they've sought to eliminate? Because it kind of feels like they have centralized the decision making here. Yeah. And unsurprisingly, there has been some backlash from the community. We'll link to a Reddit thread where you can read some of what people have been saying. But I imagine that this was a, a very tough decision to make, yeah. right? And, and I think in fairness to, to, to David Vorak and the, the rest of the SIA team, they've done a very good job of communicating a lot of this. There's some, there's some really good reads. And actually, I would highly recommend reading a lot of David Vorak's stuff around ASIC mining and the whole industry. Um, it's a real eye-opener. 
and we'll we'll make sure we link out to those. I think that's where we're going to wrap up this conversation. I don't think we have the answers to these questions. I think we're posing them. We would love to hear any of your thoughts on this issue. If the SIA team have things they want to mention to us, if the Bitmain team, hell, if Tim Berners-Lee wants to come out and make a comment, <laughs> you can hit us up on Twitter at The Coin Offering. If you want to do something a bit more private, drop us an email at podcast at thecoinoffering.com. I think to round things up, it's been a pretty eventful few weeks. I'm excited, nervous to kind of see how this pans out, but hopefully you've learned a little bit about the mining industry. And until next time, we'll see you next Friday. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to show your appreciation to me and Austin, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review on the CastBox app or on your favorite podcasting platform. We'd really appreciate it. If you haven't already, make sure you download the free CastBox app where you'll find us as one of the CastBox original shows. You can also visit thecoinoffering.com to learn more about cryptocurrencies, get caught up on some news, see how your currency is performing, and you can finally follow us on Twitter at The Coin Offering. Lastly, but not leastly, you can ask us any questions you have by emailing us at podcast at thecoinoffering.com. The Decrypting Crypto Podcast is a CastBox original show, and its content should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.